Jesus and Him only. Amen. So what are you really like after you leave church for the week? Some of you don't want to tell me, I know. Hey, listen, it's just as bad with me. We have our church faces, even at this service, and we have our other faces. And one of the things that Paul talks about to the church at Colossae and at Ephesus is, you know, you, especially at Ephesus, but here too, you guys have lived a certain way in Ephesus, so what you guys have been stealing, you can't steal any longer. You've been lying all the time. You can't lie any longer. In Corinth, you've been sleeping with everybody you meet. You can't do that anymore because you're a child of God, you see? You're a new person. And so what the Apostle Paul does in this chapter is he, he's going to personalize it to marriage and the work life, and he, has, he does address the issue of slavery, and I'll explain some of that. He talks about what it means to be a parent and know Jesus and what it means to be a kid and know Jesus and what it means to trust God for amazing things. And so I want you to consider that we only have a glimpse of what happens to people in Scripture. Some of you ever heard of blind Bartimaeus? That didn't ring a bell? No? No? Okay, we need some work in the Scriptures here. But blind Bartimaeus was a guy crying out to know Jesus, crying out, crying out, crying out. And Jesus touched him and healed him and gave him sight. He was no longer blind Bartimaeus. You're going to meet him one day in heaven. But what I was wondering, what was his life like uh, after he went home? Or the demoniac who lived in the land of the Gerasenes, who was out of his mind. He was in chains. and He was literally filled with horrible demons. And Jesus set him free. And you're going to meet the demoniac one day. The demoniac went home to his village and everybody would have been scared of this guy. He was an absolutely horrifying dude filled with evil powers. What was his life like after that? Well, how about you and me when we encounter Jesus in the sacrament and in the word? What is it like to go back home? Are we different people? So let's stand for the word of God. And we're gonna, this is going to become very specific, George. Husbands and wives and workers. And, and you'll see it. Verse 18 through verse 1 of chapter 4. The word of the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, <clears throat> excuse me, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there's no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Here's the three principles. And again, remember, these principles are, prep are really a foundation so you can have a meeting with God. The first is this. Once you know Jesus, what does it look like? Radically new relationships. Can you hear that? I'm talking about in every aspect of life. As a husband, as a single person, as an employer, as a dad, as a kid, everything changes because Jesus Christ has entered your life. That's the first. The second principle is radically new motivation. I do what I do what I do what I do for different reasons. And thirdly, radically new hope. I'm not tied to the circumstances of my life, but my hope is rooted in something much greater. Are you all ready? All right. Radically new relationships. Now, most of the time when people in our town pick up the Bible and read about wives submitting to husbands, they think about what? Yikes, stripes, what in the world am I reading here? What in the world are you talking about? But I want you to, I want you to know this, ladies, particularly you ladies, as you're reading Scripture and understand a little of the history. Because apart from the gospel, women had very little value in the culture especially in the Roman Empire. Talk about treating women with dignity and respect as a co-heir of Christ, as a child of God. Are you kidding me? Let's just put it real simple. I, I, and I'll stand behind this thesis. 
Apart from Jesus Christ, women have always been treated as cattle. Okay? I, I can bear that out in a doctoral dissertation or in a five-minute conversation. That the gospel has so transformed the way we look and the way we treat women. Absolutely powerful. Just to give you an idea, you know, uh, not all Muslim dads are bad dads. And not all of them treat their wives like cattle. But when I was coming back from Ethiopia, it was a long trip, 18 hours. And um, it was really, really interesting. A Muslim lady, really sweet lady, checked in with these two little kids. One was one, one was two and a half. And the dad checked them in. And I know it was the dad because the little boy looked just like dad's face, okay? I'm pretty smart like that. And um, it was the longest of journeys, and they were really upset. And the dad checked him in, said goodbye, and went all the way up to the front of the plane. That was the last I saw of him. And um, so she's trying to juggle everything. And it was amazing. You know, uh, w- one diaper change, and the other one screaming. And she's trying to figure out. And I had to kind of, I helped her while she would go to the bathroom, playing with the little one-year-old and interacting. But my point was, unless you have a respect of women and who they are as co-heirs of Christ. He didn't care less about them. And I'm just using that as an example. There was no, now I I told some of my my female friends here in Denver, they said he would have been dead if he was my husband. Totally dead, he would have been toast. Stick a knife in him, he is done. Okay, that's American women, okay? We understand that. No dad's gonna get away with that. I'll go up and watch some movies while you change the diapers. Yeah, right, that works real well. But my point is the reason why we don't do that is that the gospel has so transformed the way we look at our sisters in Christ. Now, so when people say about wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord and all this stuff, that is chauvinist. No, it's not. The fact that he's using language here that's based on the relationship of Christ being a part of their lives. So let me go back to it. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. This is a whole new relationship. He's the spiritual leader. You both are equal, co-heirs. But what is fitting is that he treats you right. If he doesn't, you don't have to follow anything. And it's saying the whole concept of marriage is so different. So different. Then it goes on to say, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Well, that's just laughable in the Roman culture. I'll be harsh with her if I want to be. I'm the macho man of this marriage. And the Christian faith totally transforms the way husbands and wives are to treat each other. And let me just tell you four ways the church stood out like a sore thumb in the first century. You know what that expression, sore thumb? I don't know where it came from. Anybody? No? Brian's been up late at night watching ESPN for hours, and so this is where he's fighting it right now, but he's a good man. I'm having fun with him. He's been up. So Caitlin leaves, and he stays up late at night. I'm trying to understand that. I'm going to do a dissertation on that. Okay, let's get back to it. Um, how he, no, it's true. He, Caitlin leaves and he stays up to all wild hours. I'm trying to understand that as his friend. Now back to the text. Um, how is the church different in the first century? They're all wondering back there, Brian. Oh, Brian hates me right now. Okay. <clears throat> no, you don't. You love me. No, you know you do. <laughs> the church was really, really strange in the Roman Empire. Okay? Let me tell you why. The first reason is that they really cared about handicapped people. And they thought of them as valuable. When, when Steve Hill and I were in China a year ago, we learned some, we had a guy in our church that was physically disadvantaged. He was legally blind. And the group leader didn't know he was coming. And it was really quite a trip. And uh, he, he couldn't barely see much in front. And we were in crazy traffic without lights and trying to keep him alive, literally. And, but I noticed when he would bump into people, and we love the Chinese people, okay? Understand that. We love them. But they don't like disadvantaged people, handicapped people. They put them away so you're not seeing them. And so they would be like, what are you doing out here? I mean, it was just a visceral reaction. How dare you bump me like that? Because he couldn't see. And, And my point was the first century church had little value for handicapped people. You want to talk about handicapped rights and concern for people that couldn't walk and wheelchair access and all that stuff. That comes out of a worldview that has every person bearing dignity. And the other thing that the Christian church was known for in the first century was caring about unborn babies. I mean, abortion has always been a huge issue in world history. If you don't want the baby, get rid of it. It, yes. And Christians started to care for the unborn, and it really was like wild. It was like, are you kidding? Who are you? Now, this one's going to throw you even more. 
Christians, the first century church, began to develop a very, develop a very distinct Christian ethos and philosophy and theology. Oh, put it simpler than that, Doug. They were all sli- everybody was sleeping with everybody they met. Prostitution was rampant. When they came to Christ, they began to see God's purpose for sex. And they began to see it as a relationship between a husband and wife, and that was totally radical. I mean, ridiculously radical. And that the wife would have protection in the marriage. And it was so wild that secular writers, and, you, and I could point you to many of them, would say, whoa, these, these people do things entirely different. Their view and understanding of God's purpose for sex and protecting women sexually. You want to talk about women's rights, we could go into that too. Another way the, the church stood out was the use of wealth. I have money so I can have fun. I can have fun. Sound like America? Yep, yep, yep. I have money so I can have fun. I can do what I want to do. I can do what I want to do. I can build bigger barns. I can have big stuff for me. I can get my own yacht. Wait a minute. What are these Christians doing? They're constantly talking about the offering for the poor in Jerusalem and for those who don't have as much. There's a concern for the oppressed. They stood out like a sore thumb. And then finally... They would associate with the lowly. I think we're going to do that at this service. I really do. I think we're going to have executives in this service taking communion next to street people who are on drugs. I really mean that. You say, what? That's what the first century church did. They had homeless people associating with people of power. And the world would say, what is this about? And so they stood out like a sore thumb. Say, why is he addressing marriage? You know, it's funny, I, I said this morning, um, and by the way, 50-some percent of all people now are single in the population. I wonder how what it is in Denver. I think it's higher. So if you're not married, God's working in you. He's giving you your own unique challenges. But if you want to know how to grow spiritually in, uh, in a faster way, <laughs> get married. See, people are married, they get that, they understood that. People are single and say, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Because you find out how selfish you are. You find out how selfish you are. You find out how, whoa, 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 you're, you're invading my space. And I've got to forgive you? No, I'm ticked off at you. What do you mean I've got to love you? And so marriage is God's school of growth. And, and so, now if you don't get married, you're going to grow like crazy too, okay? I, I, I want to make sure. Not everyone is called to marriage, but those of you that are married, you're going to have this incredible sense of being stretched at times where you, do, you want to just kill your mate, not matter, you know, you love him at that point. But there is this sense of learning how to forgive and growing and growing and growing. It's really the, one of the best ways we can grow to become like Jesus. Now, <clears throat> please hear me. I didn't say if you never marry, you'll never become like Jesus. I'm just saying marriage is a school of growth, and anybody that's been married can say amen to that. Now look what he says here. It's very specific. He says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now, Julie, you'd want to give him, Ethan kind of want to elbow that. Do you hear that part? Do you hear that part? Okay. But William, you get to give Rex an elbow in a second here too. Because it says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they be discouraged. Don't be too hard on them. Don't push them so hard that their spirit literally wilts. And so nobody would care about things like that. But why is he, Paul, addressing that? Because when you come to Jesus Christ, there's a radical change in your character. It begins because the presence of God's life is living within you. And you can't become the same boyfriend. You can't be the same husband. You can't even be the same kid. You can't even be the same father. And so we are transformed people. Let it hit you, and let it speak to you. Now, what about slavery? I know you're going to ask me about this. Our secular friends would say, see, 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 this is why I don't want to mess with the Bible, because it condones slavery. No, no, no. I think you need to realize historically, and I know you do, that slavery has always been a huge part of human history. Huge. For example, in the Roman world, about 40% of the population were slaves. You say, why? Why? Well, there are many reasons, and I'm glad you asked. One of which was the Romans were always conquering people. Does that make sense? They were always invading and conquering. They were an army on the move. And when you conquered a foreign people, you had all these what? Soldiers, sometimes up to 40,000, 50,000 at a time. 
And so it was actually it was a compassionate thing. They would actually integrate them into their culture as bond servants, as slaves, and they had an opportunity to work their way out of slavery. Slavery was also a means of getting out of debt. They didn't have bankruptcy court. You couldn't just declare bankruptcy. And actually, many parents had to sell their children into slavery. That's not a good thing, but they did to, to, to get back financially on their feet. And so there was this sense of slavery was a very different institution. Now, I, wanna, I want you to say this. Hear this, please, because even in the ancient world, slavery was different than the horrifying slavery that America has known in our past and Great Britain and, and the more recent things in history. Why? Because it was racially based. In the Roman world, it wasn't based on race. It was based on economics. And, please hear this, in the Roman world, you could actually move out of slavery. There was a sense, you had, it would be like uh, slaves were doing the job in the Roman Empire that many illegals are doing in the United States today. And there's not a complete parallel there, but it was somewhat like that. They, they, were, they were a major part of the Roman economy, 40%. And so what Paul is saying here is not that slavery is a good thing. And I want you to hear this too. If it wasn't for the Christian faith, there never would have been a doing away with slavery in Great Britain. And if it wasn't for the true preaching of the gospel, there never would have been an end to slavery in America. Those kind of rights and dignity come from the gospel and a biblical worldview. Otherwise, please hear it, people are cattle. All right? So he's saying here, okay, you're in a situation. You're in slavery. It's like being in debt as a student. But right now, you're a bond servant. He says, obey in everything those who, your earthly, who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. What is eye service? Well, you know what that is. Your, your boss comes around, and how do, you do, how do you look busy, right? You're just poured into that. You're just focused on that computer. You're not reading emails, okay? Uh, hey, I'm working hard. As soon as the boss leaves, what happens? <laughs> Some of you own companies. You know what it's like. Playtime. The cat's away. The mice will play. All right? And so he's saying, no, no, you don't work for this boss. You don't work. You do it with a sense of fear and reverence because you belong to the Lord. That's how radical your relationships are. You do it unto the Lord. It is a radically new relationship. And it says, fearing the Lord, it's a deep sense of reverence. Now, here's what you're asking, I think. What if there's no change in my life? And what if I'm still a harsh husband? What if I'm flipping about my work? I would say maybe you don't know the gospel yet. I'm not saying you're not a Christian, but maybe you're not. Maybe you have not understood who Jesus is because this radical change has not begun in your life. You can't be the same husband. You can't be the same single person. And you can't be the same employee or employer if you know Jesus Christ. Now, if you're sitting there filled with guilt right now, come on. The gospel is a gift of God to you and he comes to you and embraces you. I would just say throw yourself on the mercy of Jesus. But as you know, Christ is a radically new relationship. Husbands, wives, this is a relationship now that's based on Christ and the church. And that's why it's for life. That's why it's different. It's different. It's different. It's sacred. And it's set apart. All right, amen? We awake? Everybody still with me? Okay, I didn't hear any snoring. All right, all right. All right, second principle, a radical new motivation. Whatever you do, work heartily. As for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the, in the inheritance as your reward. Now, let me ask you a question. Please don't answer out loud. And I have to ask myself this, too, because I'm held to a higher standard. Why'd you get up and come this morning? Because. You know, hopefully, you, you, the answer is because you wanted to worship Jesus. But, but sometimes we see our faith as just checking off a list and doing stuff. 
And, and this is about the real change in the motivation of your heart. Now here, here's what I said. I made a commitment that I couldn't believe the words came out of my mouth at the first service. I said, where do these words come from? Be careful what you say up here, Doug. I, I made a commitment to the congregation that if I ever get up and preach the word just because I need the money and I'm behind on bills and I'm not ready to retire, I said, I will step out of that pulpit so fast. I said, what did I just say? Because the only motivation, the only motivation, the only motivation for ever standing up here with the gall to speak God's word to you is out of a love and obedience to Jesus Christ, out of reverence for Christ. Do you see that? And it's the same way if you work at Arby's or if you preach the word. That's what he's saying. If you work at Arby's, nobody wants to work at Arby's. Maybe some of you do. I've got to be careful here. I love their ads. We've got the meat. Um, the point is, he's saying, you know what? If you work at Arby's, or if you cut lawns for the summer, I used to do that, which wasn't smart for a person with asthma and allergies. I didn't always have a brain. I had my own lawn business, and I had cats, which I'm most allergic to. See, there's a need for wisdom in all of our lives. And I'm serious. But I, you do it unto the Lord. Now, here's what most of us say. I can't stand working in Arby's. I'm not, you think I'm going to give my heart and soul to this company? They could care less about people. You, you should see what they're paying me. I know, I know. You should see what they're paying me. Paul is saying, if you're a believer, there's a radical change in your motivation in everything you do so that you begin to work as if you're working directly for Jesus Christ, even if you can't stand your boss. Do you see that? That's an amazing claim. And Benson's saying, I have to work for Doug, and now I finally got it straightened out. I, I think I can do it. I think I can do it. He just had a breakthrough right there. Right on the spot he broke through. <laughs> That's true. You finally broke through. I can't do it anymore, Lord. Oh, I can. Whoa. <laughs> so here's what it says. You know, when I think of the word heartily, I think of that chunky Campbell. What is that chunky soup with Donovan McNabb's mother in the camera? Oh, come on. Help me out. You know, hearty soup and stuff. But it's like, heartedly, what does that mean? But it actually is a great translation. Now, here's your one Greek word for the month of June, okay? So don't go to sleep completely. The word, because I want you to see, uh, many of these words are like our words. The word is ek psyche. The word ek means from or out of. Out of, emanating from. What's the word psyche remind you of? It's not a trick question here. Psychology, the study of the human soul or life, human core of who we are, the psyche. And it, what it literally means, it could have, he could have said ek cardia, out of your heart, but it really meant who you are on a deeper level, even in the heart. It says, do it with all of you, versus what? Checking it in, mailing it in. In sports, we talk about leaving it all on the field. So what I said without realizing it, if I'm up here just to earn money, I'm out of here. I can't do that. And I challenge Brian the same way, because Brian and I are going to be held to a different standard. We are. It's a higher standard as ordained pastors. And so if we're just doing it for the wrong reasons, get out. Get out. So I may be out of a job soon. But the point is, what motivation are you doing this, Doug? What motivation are you doing the things that you do, you do, you do, you do? Why do you play in this great band? Why do you come? Are we committed to building Christ's church and being the kind of people? The point is the motivation has changed. By the way, the reason I stopped sinning has changed. Did you know that? What? The reason I stopped sinning has changed. As a religious person, I used to stop sinning so God would hear my prayers and I could make a bargain with him. Maybe God will do this for me. That's religion. Maybe if I clean up my act... And don't drink, smoke, chew, go with girls that do. Maybe things will get better in my life. A little better karma, right? Better karma. When I heard the gospel and I realized that he took me as a miserable wretch and brought me to himself and gave me everything and forgave me and loved me, the reason I stopped sinning is not to get his attention. The reason I stopped sinning is I have experienced the gospel. And I've never experienced love like this before. Amen, guys? So don't give up. 
dying to the horrible sin in your life. You know what he says here is so cool? Verse 24, I was going to say Nathan, but Nathan's nowhere to be found. He's off somewhere on a boat. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. What inheritance, huh? What inheritance is this? What, what, what? That's the inheritance that Christ received from the Father. Belongs to all those who are in him. And here's what it's saying. Your motivation is not that you've already experienced his grace and salvation in the past. It's what you will receive if you walk faithfully. And it's saying, you know what? I can put up with this hard time in my life. I I can put up with this employer. I can put up with this financial stress right now. I can put up with this situation, living situation. It's just not the best. I can put up with this this time in my life where everything's just not really clear. I can put up because I know who's got me. He's got my back. And he'll get me home before dark. And I want my motivation to be one of love for him. The Bible says that in the last days, the love of many will grow hot or cold. 50-50 chance. Good. Thank you, Vincent. It's a major text. He said, in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. People be hard, cynical. For us, in the last days, our love will grow warm because our motivation has changed. So I even challenged people in the first service that some of you have been in the choir for over 1,800 years. And uh, I did add that up, by the way, Brian, so it is that long. (laughs) What's your motivation for singing in the choir? Why are you doing this? Why are you a deacon? Why, 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 why do you want to be part of Benson's cool band? What's your motivation? Tantina just said, I have no idea. I have no idea in God's green earth is what she just said. <laughs> but no, um, what is your motivation? And if it's anything other than the gospel, you'll be living a very selfish life. All right, it's a new motivation. The reason I do what I do what I do what I do what I do is because Jesus Christ has taken me as his own and he's living in me and I can't go back to being the same person. All right. Thirdly and finally, and then we're going to sing because the hour has come. It said 1200. Oh, okay. A radically new hope. What's your hope based in? I bet it's based on how many friends you have, how things are going. Most people in the world, life has been really tough. But look what it's saying here. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. One of the verses that has given Christians across the world comfort for centuries is this. And most Christians have been persecuted. We get to live a very fun life comparatively. And it's from Romans. Vengeance is mine saith the Lord, I will repay. What does that mean? I will make things right. I will bring about justice. My justice has come to fruition on the cross, but I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. I am not done yet. Now, we pursue justice. We go to court. We seek justice for the poor and the oppressed, and those who have no voice. We seek justice, but not everybody will get justice in this world. And the Bible is saying there's many slaves or bond servants that have had horrible masters and nothing makes sense. God seemingly has allowed all kind of things to happen. God seemingly has allowed tragedy to occur like in the South Sudan where many Christians have lost their kids. They've been kidnapped by Muslim families. Many of them have. They may never see their kids and they're going to say, God, where are you? What are you doing? Are you there? And the Bible is saying, hold on. God will make things right. We have a master in heaven who will work things out. And by the way, you don't cry out for justice when you come to God. You cry out for mercy because we too need the grace of God. Do you see that? So it is a whole new hope. My hope is not tied on what's going on in my life. My hope is based on the fact that he's got me and he has died for me and he's working in me. And I can never lose my hope. Now one quick thought about that when you start to lose your hope. It's often because you lose your joy. Did you know that? The joy of the Lord is our what? Only one answer on that is Joe Bisnardo, huh? Okay, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Why do you think Benson is so obnoxious on this joy thing? (laughs) 
Did you ever wonder why he is? He, and once in a while, he says some intelligent things up here, too. He really does. I love you, dude. Come on. I, I'm gone for five weeks so you can have a wonderful time. Okay. Um, um, no, he talks about joy all the time. Remember you did last week? You said all about the fruits of the Spirit. I was listening. You said that joy is the hardest one to come by. Why? So what, what happened? When we lose our joy, we lose our hope. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. That's why we worship. That's why we sing. And when you lose your hope, you literally give up. You literally give up. You don't want to grow. You don't want to meet God. You're just basically going through the motions. But you have a whole new different motivation. And we know that our God will work things out. Now, as a believer, you know he's going to work out every detail of your life. If you're not a believer, right now he's speaking to you. He's speaking to you. You happen to be here for this purpose or watching via the internet. And he's speaking to you. He's calling you to a relationship. You can push him away if you want. But he's calling so you will know him. And he wants to pour out his life in you. A radically new hope. God has made things right on the cross. All our buddies will say, when is God going to show up? He has shown up. It's called Christmas. Well, when is he going to do something? He has. It's called Easter. Death, burial, resurrection. But it's not only that he has made things right. He is making things right. Right now. He's working things out in our lives. And finally, he will make things right. So Jesus didn't just talk the talk the talk. He walked the walk. Now, we're going to have the privilege this week of walking what's called the Via Della Rosa in the footsteps of Jesus where he carried the cross and Simon of Cyrene had to pick it up because it was, he, it was just weighing him down. But God didn't just talk about loving you. He intervened through his own son. And he gives us a whole new motivation. For my hope is not based on what is happening in my life. My hope is based on what has happened to my life through the love and power of Jesus Christ and the gospel. May yours be also. Let's pray. Amen. Father God, this is your word. It's precious. We love you and thank you that you, you give us a picture of what life is to be and the rich and poor ministering together, the addict and the free uh, with their arms around one another being the church. And as, um, as we get ready to have our communion. As we listen to the song and have our communion, we pray that we would experience Christ through the sacrament. And again, if there's anyone here who has not, uh, not given their lives to Jesus Christ, and there's a real pull, and you know you need to do that. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart. I want to know you. I receive you in your finished work, and I receive your life. And I have become a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to do our song first, right? How are we doing this, Brian? Can you stand there for a whole song, Mike? And then I'll lead the communion. Cool. Let's stand. The answer is yes. Step out of our comfort zones, and I think it'd be really cool if we actually turn to your loved one.